Tonight on Ham Nation, we have the Poets and Amateur Radio Club. George programs a pick. Gordo's going to recap the wildfires in SoCal for us. And Don's facing yet again another Hurricane Zeta. Stay tuned tonight on Ham Nation. Ham Nation is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by LastPass. LastPass can help you manage identities and promote good security behaviors while your employees are remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. This is Ham Nation, episode 477, October 28th, 2020. Club Spotlight on Powhatan Amateur Radio Club. Good evening, everybody. It's Bob Heil, K9EID in uh, rainy Belleville, southern Illinois, southwestern Illinois. But um, we don't have it half as bad as what's coming up down the coast. But uh, hopefully Don's going to be okay. But we have a wonderful show tonight. Got a great club, a great club from Virginia. You're going to love this. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But, uh, hey, let's see who all's here. First, jo- uh, uh, George is here. George, you're looking dapper in your hat <laughs> and your well, body. Thank you, Bob. I, I thought I'd go with the cowboy look tonight. Unfortunately, this is close as I could get to it. But I, I, I do have my companion over here. We, we ran into a little rough trouble out on the range there, so he's not feeling so well tonight. <laughs> well, I, uh, I didn't get home in time. We're so busy at the, at the microphone assembly plant. I just got home in time to get things started in fact um, my computer was still loading when you guys called me so i didn't have time to do anything i had plans but hurrah so thanks to everybody for keeping us busy what's happening in costa mesa that's the important thing right now well hi bob um it was a huge windstorm i went outside uh, that morning and i found all of these guys in my front yard and i thought Oh, my gosh, those are quarter wavelength elements off my two meter long boomers times two. Um, (laughs) When I got a closer look, they were nothing more than holiday Halloween uh, doodads that the neighbors had lost down the street. So that was good news. Even (laughs) more good news. Look at this. Ham radio outlet goes all color, all color in their new HRO catalog, and of course, IL Sound, all color, and of course, ICOM America, all color in the new Ham Radio Outlet catalog. So when you get the new catalog, uh, thank um, Chip and Janet and all of their uh, team for a great job. And we'll be looking more at their setup in a few minutes. Back to you, Bob. Okay, yeah, it's really nice. That new catalog is great. And I know that a lot of people put out catalogs, but they, they got to be in full color, I thought. So, yeah, that's wonderful. And, but all the weather's okay? You're, you're okay? No fires or anything like that? That's kind of subsided for you, Gordon? Uh, no, not at all. And uh, you'll see them shortly. Uh, not oh, for real, okay. though, luckily. Gotcha. All right. Well, um, we're going to uh, fire up the old spotlight here. Uh, I, I want everybody to know if you have a, a club and you're proud of it, you need to let me know about it because we're going to put you in the club spotlight. And I'm very excited about the club tonight. Uh, I've been uh, trying to get things worked out with them for a while and we got it happening and we have two gentlemen tonight from there. So, Jim, how are you doing? And uh, what what's going on in your club with uh, you and Kurt? 
Uh, good evening, Bob, and uh, thank you for having us on tonight. Uh, we've been looking forward to this and uh, finally glad that we were able to get all the logistics worked out. And uh, we're just excited to be with you tonight. Very good. I worked with Kurt today. Thanks for the pictures, Kurt. They all turned out good. Well, let's get right into it. Tell us a little bit about what the club is and where it's uh, located and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, Bob, we're um, called the uh, we're called Park Powhatan Area Radio Club, and we're located in Powhatan County, Virginia, which is a a rural jurisdiction just west of the uh, city of Richmond, of the state capital. And uh, we've only been in existence for a couple of years now, uh, but in these last couple of years, we've exploded in. Uh, uh, in membership as well as activities and our capabilities here in the county and uh, it's just been really fun to, d to work with these guys. We, uh, uh, one of the things that we love to do is uh, our field day and uh, we, we participate in the summer field day and as well as the winter field day. Um, and you can see there's always something good to eat there, that's for sure, but uh, Absolutely. Uh, our, <laughs> Our club is uh, is always trying to do something good. We uh, utilize the county's mobile emergency operations center, which is a uh, a van. Or actually, it's like a camper trailer almost uh, that's outfitted with a lot of uh, radio electronic stuff. And uh, the the club utilizes that and puts up their wire antennas in the trees and things. And we operate uh, um, from those uh, from those sites as well. Yeah, you're looking at uh, some of our members there uh, actually uh, doing some satellite communication. This was on a summer field day. You can see everyone's wearing short sleeve shirts. We don't do that in the wintertime, although the winters are pretty mild here in uh, Virginia. But uh, one of the things that uh, when Kurt and I uh, founded this club, uh, we made a pact with each other that uh, we would do this as long as it was fun. And uh, as it's turned out, uh, this club is really focused on having fun. And uh, most of the pictures you'll see are, uh, are our members that are doing exactly that, having fun with amateur radio and with good fellowship and uh, learning and teaching each other as we go. When we uh, set up for our field days, uh, we, we usually have way more people helping than, than uh, than necessary, and I think that's because uh, we are, are are very focused on on having fun and doing uh, the activities that uh, that that people can enjoy doing. As and then we use our hobby to have fun as well. Uh, uh, so you know that's really one of the 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 things that we pushed from here. Uh, um, I think it's exp important for your listeners to know that. Uh, when they're they're talking about well how can how can we do something similar in our areas that uh, it's really all about relationship building with your local emergency manager and uh, and you, the the members of the club um, uh, I couldn't operate in my emergency operations center with the backup communications capabilities that we have without them and uh, so we have a very symbiotic relationship. Um, uh, I was able to secure uh, funding from the Department of Homeland Security to uh, to get the equipment that we needed for our repeater, and uh, we've been enjoyed a, a great relationship. I know if I need to call on them uh, to fill in a role for something disaster related, they'll come running. Yeah, you're looking at the uh, you were just looking at the county's emergency trailer. That's our uh, the water tower that our repeater is on, and as Kurt says. Uh, we, we got a grant from the uh, State Department of uh, Emergency uh, Management to put a repeater there. Uh, when Kurt and I originally met, I was the <coughs> EC for Powhatan and he was the new emergency manager for Powhatan. And uh, we had a meeting actually right here in the same room we're in tonight. And Kurt said, what do we need to, uh, to, to make an ARIES uh, operation work in Powhatan? And uh, we are a rural community. Uh, we do have some other repeaters that serve part of the county, but we didn't have a repeater that served the whole county. 
So our objective was to uh, to put this repeater up on the water tower, and there you see, uh, you can tell that we're we're a rural community there. That's from the top of the water tower. Excuse me, water tank. <laughs> yeah, you get that right. Right, right. and uh, and so uh, we uh, there you see some of our members actually uh, hoisting the hard line up inside the uh, the water tank. Uh, these these folks, even though they're all wearing hard hats, they are amateur radio operators, and uh, they were there to help uh, our commercial climber uh, install the hard line. Um, and uh, we had about 18 people show up that day, and that was uh, before the club really got going. And uh, once the repeater came online, then uh, we sh we found people that we didn't didn't even know had ham radios in the county. They start showing up uh, for nets on the repeater, and it's just grown uh, very very quickly from that. So uh, uh, having a good reliable communication asset in the county has has really been key to our growth and to the excitement of the members. Uh, that have joined us uh, in the what two years, Kurt? Yeah. About two years right. that we've uh, we've been <clears throat> in existence, and uh, so uh, it's it's been a very uh, it's been a very fun uh, couple of years. Uh, it's been a busy couple of years. There you see our uh, commercial climber uh, doing what we call the Spider Man uh, uh, trick there to uh, attach the hard line to the side of the tank, and. Uh, I'm glad that was him doing that and not me. Um, you can see we've got uh, three seven eight inch hard lines running up the uh, entire inside uh, length of the water tank, and uh, we have three dual band antennas on the top, so that we could reconfigure any antenna to do basically anything that we needed it to do. We're running a uh, WireZX System Fusion VHF repeater and a DMR linked repeater. And the uh, third hard line is for a uh, Winlink gateway. So uh, we really are a digital uh, repeater, even though we still have analog capability and lots of folks use that, but we enjoy the uh, digital capabilities. One of the things that we did, Bob, was uh, really start up. I, I had experience with fox hunts when uh, I was emergency manager in Virginia Beach and I had a great time doing that stuff. And so. We, uh, I proposed the idea of doing some fox hunts out here, and uh, it's really caught on. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's a, a great time. Uh, we have a really good uh, a bunch of people that are very technical in rain, uh, in um, in finding frequencies and stuff like that. We've we've actually been used once by the uh, um, the local uh, communications people to to track a. Uh, a signal that was causing a problem with the public safety net. But, you, uh, you've got to comment on that picture, Kurt. <laughs> um, this was um, this was gosh, our this, second field day. Yeah, the second field day. We had this out there uh, uh, with what we told. One of the things that we found was funny was people would come up to us in the park and they'd ask, "Well, how did you get this uh, that antenna up into the tree? I mean, it's just amazing. Though, how'd you get that wire up there?" And we tell we were telling people that uh, we had trained uh, Squirrel. uh, squirrels that uh, would take the end of the wire and run up the tree, and you know they would look at us kind of like, uh, uh, really. And so one year we put a little cage out here and uh, to show people that this was our our uh, our squirrels that we used to put our our wire antennas up in the tree for field day. Yeah, but no animals were harmed during our antenna installations. <laughs> Well, you guys have way too much fun, but that's what it's all about, having a lot of fun. That's for sure. How many members are in the club? Uh, I'd say we probably have uh, 15 to 17 very active, uh, another 10 that uh, show up when they can. <laughs> are you doing any Zoom or Skype meetings? Yes, we uh, back in the uh, spring, we had a couple of meetings by Zoom uh, because we were we were concerned about the COVID-19 crisis, and uh, in the summertime when the weather got a little bit warmer, we decided well we would have our meetings outdoors, and so uh, we meet in the parking lot of a local establishment that uh, supports our operations, 
and uh, everybody brings a chair, and we sit uh, six, eight feet apart, and uh, we have our uh, we have our meetings outdoors. Uh, it's going to be getting cold pretty soon, so uh, we're looking at uh, some other options, and we may have to go back to the Zoom for the winter months. Well, that'll be great. We're, we're, uh, I'll look forward to visiting you. I'm doing two and three a week of Zoom meetings. Sometimes they'll have over 100 people in them. And this is what it's all about right now. Uh, we've, we have to keep our clubs active. And what's happening in a lot of the clubs that I do the presentations each week for, the clubs are actually growing in membership uh, because they don't have to go outside and they don't have to do a bunch of things. And man, it's uh, it's really helped so many of them uh, to grow their club. So uh, any club that is out there that wants to do it, all you got to do is send us a note because Gordon does a lot of those too. So uh, we can help you and uh, help you have fun with your club. There's no reason you can't. Anything in the future that's going to be uh, eye-popping for you, Jim? I think that uh, a couple of the things that we've got in the future as we uh, try to secure some more funding, we want to uh, improve our footprint here in the county with another digital repeater. We're uh, exploring getting into uh, mesh technology uh, as well uh, so that we can have some backup capabilities in there. Um, also, trying to find as many different uh, cool projects and activities that we can do with our members. Uh, like Jim said, uh, in our, our meetings, we end up spending more time talking about uh, what, what we can do, what fun thing we can do than we do talking about radios. Uh, so, you know, that fellowship, that relationship building between the county and the club is so important. I think that that's the, the holy grail of uh, working with a local jurisdiction is uh, building that relationship with the, with the emergency manager and the county. and and uh, uh, one hand is washing the other and it's it's a, a great time we're looking forward to our future growing um, you know check out our website uh, make sure like you say uh, n4pow.com it's a great website it uh, is a very visual very active uh, uh, site that uh, provides some good information uh, and we're pretty excited about that as as well it's always changing so people should try to come back that uh, uh, we're, gl we're glad to, uh, if anybody has any questions about, you know, how we were able to do this, um, you know, our funding stream is like nothing here as far as the club. Um, in fact, we don't even have bylaws or constitution or nothing. Our only rule is uh, have fun. And we're doing that. That's the way to do it. I started the Marissa Amateur Radio Club back in uh, around 1980 in a, in a little town of 2,000 people. And there were uh, three hams. Uh, the uh, in, in less than a couple of years, we had 300 members in that club because we always had fun. And uh, uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, you ask Gordon West how to do that. Hey, Gordo, what do you got to say? Uh, don't they have a great group? <laughs> it's wonderful, and I so much appreciate the comment about getting close to your served agency through the new American Radio Relay League ARES programs. All that training, and I'm sure both of you can echo this, all that training is well recognized by the city's emergency communications manager, and that gets us even closer to serving our served agencies. Yeah, well, they, uh, uh, they've got it going on, that's for sure. And I'm sure glad you came back and uh, uh, got with me on this, Jim. And uh, Kurt, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do uh, after going to your website. And uh, that's on the screen right now. So everybody uh, mark it all down. It's real easy to find. And uh, see what else they got cooking because they got these these guys got it going on i'm sure well thanks so much for spending your time and uh, keep us keep us in mind and other things or and i'd like to come and join you uh, on a meeting one time so thanks for coming have a good time happy halloween and all that but uh, main thing is have fun and boy you guys thank you dr do. bob thank you very much thank you for being here all right well, Gordo, that, that's where it is, is 
clubs that know how to have have fun. Uh, too many, I think, sometimes take it real serious and all that kind of stuff. You got to do that, but no need to get so uh, corporate, I guess we should say. And uh, you know how to do that. You got a great group too. So we'll uh, we'll have to have to keep an eye on these guys. They they got got some things happening. So, Gordo, what's coming yep. off uh, your end of the world? I know you have some fun things. Uh, we do. Well, uh, our amateur radio emergency service group, along with many others throughout Southern California, were in full swing. And uh, that was in anticipation of what all the weather forecasters said, a combination of a high-pressure system, a low pressure system combining together to give us winds anticipated 60 to 80 miles per hour. But wait a minute, we had more important things to do. So Victor, if you wanna go ahead and beam us up to our uh, first shot, this is Halloween. So that's why I'm in my uh, routine. Thanks to Susie, my wife in 6GLF for the whiskers. And as you can see, Chip Margelli and Janet Margelli, K7JA and KL7MF, and you work us uh, each Thanksgiving. And this Thanksgiving, we're going to be again down at the beach, and we hope to work you all. Anyway, they, they really take their neighborhood uh, over by giving those kids in the neighborhood a treat that you just can't believe when they uh, see the Chip and Janet uh, house. So uh, Chip and Janet really did a great job. And uh, Victor, if we'll go to the next shot, uh, you'll see close-ups that they've <clears throat> got everything arranged on the roofs and they got all their netting up. And this is all uh, mechanized. I mean, <clears throat> uh, they wiggle, they wobble, they come on the air, they do everything. And it's quite a show that uh, the kids uh, in the neighborhood just love year after year. And of course, there's Chip's tall tower with a big beam on it. And yes, before the end of this cast or the uh, slideshow, I promise the tower is still standing. Even though he and I and others in Orange County had winds anywhere from 40 to 60 miles per hour. Well, anyway, that was before. So, um, or excuse me, that was after. This is the before shots. You come into their entryway and it's enough to scare the bejesus out of you because they all uh, make sounds and warble and light up and stuff like that. But Halloween is fun. And for those that want to get real close and look into the main window, ooh, look at what you see. So we hope all of you this coming Halloween on Saturday evening will uh, have a little bit of fun and go boo to anything that should try and spoil the fun. <clears throat> Although an omen came up as we took this shot of the moon uh, over the uh, <laughs> over the dragon up there, uh, nice and tall. <clears throat> so uh, Chip and Janet had to uh, energize uh, more things to uh, scare away the demons because nothing was going to spoil Halloween at the Margellis. They are very happy. Janet's very happy because she completed the color catalog. Chip's happy because he got all the good stuff inside the catalog accurate. And um, every year, they really give the kids on their street a, a real charge. Well, that next day, it happened. And no dragons and no boo burgers could uh, scare it away. Wildfires throughout Southern California. We've had fires up to the north, but this is what we call a Santa Ana condition. And when the Santa Ana condition occurs, fires break out big time with winds uh, scanning anywhere from 50 to 60 miles an hour. Ham radio operators operated a uh, fire net called Fire Watch, supported by the Irvine Conservancy and OC Parks. And Heiko 86OI was our first net control operator that morning. I relieved him that afternoon. And uh, he said things were getting a little bit dicey. Now, when you're looking at a whole bunch of radios, whether it's a EOC or in your room, I found out something uh, very apparent during this last fire watch. Those that have some indication that squelch is open and a call is coming through really helps you know which radio is making the noise. So I always commend those radio manufacturers that give us a status light when a call is uh, coming through. And of course, 
Bango. Calls were coming through left. At the water tank behind Foothill Ranch, uh, water dropping helicopters all around me, going up and down Borrego Canyon, as you can probably hear. I've got a good view of the southeastern part of Irvine. Lots of smoke, some new, mostly old. Uh, there's another fire down in the vicinity of the freeway that I can see, uh, but no real details on it. Uh, the troops are out in mass, the firefighters are on the hill, and uh, the helicopters are going through the canyon. Well, thank you. And that was Heiko, 86OI, um, who is uh, leading the charge. Uh, Ray, AE6H, uh, was a, uh, a big station on the air uh, for Firewatch as he's... Uh, Aircraft are coming over doing their fire retardant drops. And then Heiko said, "I'm while I'm net control, um, I do have to go QRX because I have to evacuate. Oh, no. Evacuate? So uh, here was uh, the call with Heiko uh, actually having to evacuate. <laughs> Oh, Roger, what is going to be your escape? Uh, the residents of November Radio 6 Echo, Mikkel Hansen. Again, please. Uh, look up Mikkel Hansen, NR6E. We will be at his house, which is also in Lake Forest. Ah, ham radio camaraderie, when hams can get together to save the day. And that's exactly what happened. So the Firewatch hams here in Southern California were out in full force. Uh, we have a new system uh, provided by Southern California Edison and other providers that our Firewatch volunteers that were not able to get away from their homes could actually log into on Zoom and see where these fires were headed and see the activity. But the big deal was the wind. The wind howled all night. And the next morning, I got on the air and I go, Chip, did everything survive? Uh, no, not exactly. Um, I mean, are all the inflatables uh, still on the roof? Uh, uh, so, well, not exactly. <clears throat> As you can see, the anywhere from 20 to 40 mile per hour winds down here on the flatlands uh, took uh, almost everything and turn them on their nose. But as ham radio operators know, when things don't go right, we read our A-R-E-S handbook, and it says you got to persevere. That night, they got it up and running. <clears throat> so ham radio uh, survives through all these things, and we hope all of you uh, will uh, survive, especially down in the New Orleans area and those areas this weekend that are going to be hit by that what is now a tropical storm, I'm sure. So Don is out there, and he's going to have Newsline following shortly. But let's take a look at ICOM America. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. Now shipping. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo, or just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP 272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, and live band scope with waterfall, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card slot for data storage. It comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. 
ICOM invites you to enter after each episode of Ham Nation at icomamerica.com slash ham nation to win some great swag prizes like t-shirts and hats. While you're there, you'll learn how you might win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And we've got a winner for October, the winner of the ID4100A entry-level D-Star Mobile with big rig features is Darcy Potch, K4DQP. Congratulations, Darcy. You're going to like that radio. And we've got another one for November. The grand prize is going to be the ID5100A dual-band, dual-watch D-Star transceiver. It has an intuitive touchscreen interface, DVDV and FMDV dual watch receivers, built in GPS, DV and FM near me repeater list functions, and there's an optional Bluetooth module available, as well as Bluetooth, uh, Android, and iOS apps available. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode and register to win. Sign up and good luck. This week on Smoke and Solder, we're going to look at a kit that, oh, I don't remember how long ago it was that I built this. Uh, many moons ago, it is an audio generator that at the time, the price, I believe, was $36. This thing has come down in price a good bit, and it's a fun little kit. If you don't have some kind of audio oscillator handy in the shack there, you might want to check this one out. Today's project on Ham Nation is an audio generator. This is a Velleman pocket audio generator, and it should be handy for a number of uses. A quick look at the schematic reveals that this is not an analog oscillator as I had first expected. Oh. It's actually a digital signal generator using a PIC microcontroller. Let's take a look in the box and see what goodies we have. An audio cable, an instruction manual, some labels for the kit, a case, a PC board, a string of resistors and diodes that are in order of their insertion in the kit. That will make it mighty handy. <sighs> a PIC microcontroller chip, battery holder, a couple of switches, a pot, three transistors, and a handful of capacitors and LEDs. Of course, there's a crystal, too, to clock the microcontroller. As I mentioned earlier, many of the components are already taped in order of their insertion, and that's going to make it real easy to put this kit together. We just follow through the steps and insert the parts in their order. We don't even have to look up the resistor color codes. So let's get started. Here's our completed oscillator, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz. And we've also got LED indicators here to show which scale we're on. And there's a volume control. On the side of the unit is a power switch to turn it on and off with. And on the rear, what looks like a belt clip is actually our push button that steps us through the various frequencies. I was curious just how good an oscillator this was, being a broadcast and audio engineer. So I thought I'd pull out one of my favorite pieces of gear here, the old Hewlett Packard 334A distortion analyzer, and my ancient Heathkit Nixie tube counter. So let's turn it on, and it comes on at 50 hertz, and let's set that here for zero. 
and we notice over here on the frequency counter it says it's 54 Hertz 53 thereabouts I actually took a sample of this and analyzed it in Adobe Audition and I came out with the same result so it is a little off frequency but you know that this is close enough now we'll step through the various frequencies here and, and check the uh, response of the oscillator basically how much it deviates from zero here as we go through the different steps now normally you do this on a thousand Hertz as your reference so let's step up to a thousand Hertz and we'll zero it right there now let's step back down to 50 and if we look here we are 0.7 dB hotter at 50 Hertz so not bad not way out of the ballpark but not right on zero either let's step it up to 100 Hertz and here we notice we're about 0.6 and a little change a dB boost over 1 kilohertz which is uh, a little closer and we're 103 Hertz over here on the counter let's go on up to 1 kilohertz it's still at zero let's go to 10 kilohertz we've got a little boost there we're at plus 0.6 dB and we're a little higher on the frequency counter we're at 1046 Hertz and 20,000 Hertz we're down about 0.2 dB and we're up a little on frequency as well 20,838 Hertz drifting around a little bit there on that one frequency wise yeah it's off a little but probably not enough to matter um, frequency response wise yeah it's off a little bit there too but unless we're doing measurements uh, you know precise measurements with this that's not really going to matter now we're going to measure distortion on the oscillator and we just happen to have a distortion analyzer here how handy so what we do is uh, we get set level on both the switches here and then we'll adjust the sensitivity control till we've got full scale on the meter once we've got full scale then we flip over to distortion we select a frequency range here I'm going to use times 100 and then we'll say uh, if it's a thousand Hertz then that's 10 times 100 so we'll dial on in here and what we're trying to do is null out the fundamental tone that the oscillator is producing we see it's gone down quite a bit there so let's increase our sensitivity on the meter and let's null a little more on the frequency and then we also use a balance control here to null even more we'll increase the sensitivity again and we'll do a little more nulling And it gets kind of touchy once you get down uh, very far with it. Now you may be hearing some other tones in there now that are not a thousand hertz. And what that is is the harmonic distortion that's coming from this box. Because we're listening to the output. So let's do the best we can here manually. Trying to null it. And let's flip it to auto. Let it do its best. We'll come on down to the 3% scale. So let's come on down to the 1% scale here. Full scale would be 1% distortion. So right there is 0.7. So it's almost 0.72% distortion. That's kind of high. Of course, it's going to be okay for a lot of things. If I was trying to do precise audio measurements, that would be too high of a distortion for the job. But in most cases, when you're going to use a little portable oscillator like this, that's not going to matter. You're just looking to see if you've got a signal through. And we can look over here at our frequency counter, and we see that this is, in fact, second harmonic distortion because it's a little over 2,000 hertz there. Now, we won't bother measuring the other frequencies for distortion. I just wanted to give you a little uh, quick look there at how distortion analyzer worked. There's a couple other things that you can do with this. Let's get our level back in control here. If you hold down the switch on the bottom, it switches it to a pulsed mode. Now, I'm not sure what you want to do with that. If you turn it off, hold down the button while you turn it on you've got an instant white noise generator. Now that can be handy for a lot of different things. So our summary, this is a quick and easy to build little test box 
not bad at all. And like I say, that is a really cheap kit now compared to what it used to cost. And uh, a lot of fun, handy to have around as well. Well, we're going to have Don with the news and I believe the solar weather coming up in just a moment here. But first, this message from LastPass. Tonight's episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by LastPass. LastPass has made a commitment to protecting its users for the last 12 years. And now, with 25 million users and 70,000 businesses, it's no surprise why they are the award-winning number one password manager. Living in a remote work environment has greatly impacted identity and access management for businesses. And adjusting to an online workforce hasn't just been a logistical problem, it's been a security issue. And LastPass has been a saving grace to many companies. One in particular leveraged LastPass to enable the team to set up, utilize, and share strong passwords for their accounts and programs. Not only was this a crucial and progressive step towards improving data security, it also helped ease the burden of the shift to working from home full time. And if you haven't used them yet, now is the time for your business to get LastPass. They help you transition your remote workforce. Single sign-on manages employee access in a centralized view, so IT always has insight into who has access to what and from where. Enterprise password management ensures oversight of shadow IT and enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. Multi-factor authentication requires additional factors to prove a user's identity, while the use of biometric and contextual factors make the process smooth for your employees. And there's zero knowledge security model protects everyone from the individual user to the biggest organization that uses LastPass. Your security is their top priority. They allow employees to go passwordless and access the tools they need to work. LastPass uses AES 256-bit encryption with PBKDF to SHA-256 and salted hashes to ensure complete security in the cloud. Data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level, so the data in your vault is secret from everyone, even LastPass. We use LastPass at Twit, and Twit loves it. LastPass has won eight awards so far this year. They're PC Mag's Editor's Choice. They won the Fortress Cybersecurity Award, and they're a Business Insider's Best Overall Password Manager, just to name a few. But you don't have to take our word for it. LastPass speaks for itself. There's no better time to get LastPass. Ease the burden for yourself and your remote workforce with the cybersecurity protection you need. Go to lastpass.com slash twit. That's lastpass.com slash twit. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 2243, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, October 28, 2020. The comment period has opened for the FCC's much-talked-about fee proposed for amateur radio licenses. The comment period has opened for amateur radio operators and others in the United States to weigh in the FCC's proposal to charge a $50 fee for license applications and renewals due every 10 years. In its notice published in the Federal Register, the FCC states that licenses, such as those for amateur radio, are mostly automated processes not requiring staff review. As such, the FCC is calling the proposed fee nominal saying it covers the cost of routine ULS maintenance, the automated process itself, and any occasional instance requiring staff input. Comments are due no later than the 16th of November. Reply comments can be made on or before November 30th. To file your comments, visit the webpage for the FCC's electronic comment filing system at FCC.gov stroke ECFS stroke. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Stephen Kinford, NAWB. There's one more address for the FCC that hams in the U.S. need to be aware of, and it's not on the Internet. It's at 45 L Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20554. That's the new location of the agency's headquarters. The FCC is finally in its new office after a delay in the spring caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Only a few weeks remain for teachers and other educators to be part of the next series of radio contacts with the International Space Station. If you are an educator or part of an educational organization, this is a reminder that you only have a little more than a month to apply for a ham radio contact with astronauts aboard the International Space Station. The proposal window closes on the 24th of November. Contacts are now being planned to take place between July 1st and December 30th of next year. ARIS is looking in particular for organizations that will attract a high number of participants and intend to use the experience as part of a larger education plan. Visit the website ariss.org for more details and to find the proposal form. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. And finally this week, TV's last man standing takes its last stand. 
Newsline anchor Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, has the last word. Attention TV fans, Tim Allen, KK6OTD, is going QRT on the Fox Network. The American TV sitcom Last Man Standing will begin its ninth and final season on the network early next year. The Fox Network has carried the series since May 2018, following its cancellation by ABC a year earlier. The show features Tim as amateur radio operator Mike Baxter, KA0XTT. Producer John Amadeo, a AA6JA told Newsline in an email that cast and crew are now in the process of shooting 21 shows to begin airing in January. All is not lost, however, as John noted, even after season nine is done, the show's 194 episodes will live on in syndication. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Stephen Kenford, N8WB, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We have a snake-like filament that rips off the sun, some solar storming from some fast solar wind, and a new sunspot emerges in Earthview. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week is getting very exciting. Not only are we dealing with a solar storm right now that has brought us up to active conditions and brought some aurora clear down to mid-latitudes, but the storm isn't over. This is due to some fast solar wind from a big coronal hole, and the largest finger of that coronal hole has not rotated into the Earth's strike zone yet, but it's just about to. And this means we could bump us up to storm levels and bring us even more aurora, maybe even more intense aurora that we've already seen. But believe it or not, this is not the only storm. As we take a look at the front-sided uh, sun, you can look in the eastern limb up on the north. There is a gorgeous filament. This is that filament bridge I was telling you about over the past week or so. Look at that. It finally erupts in a gorgeous display and it's created a solar storm, but it is not Earth-directed. It's actually moving towards stereo, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But that's not the only story either. We also have region 2776 that's rotating off of the sun west limb, but we have two new regions, including a new sunspot region that's going to be labeled 2778 here in the southern hemisphere. We have a bright region in the northern hemisphere. Both of those are showing signs of activity, so we could be getting some small uh, flares from that and a little bit of noise on the radio bands. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, get ready for that. That's going to add to the already kind of disturbed conditions we have due to this solar storm. So sorry that propagation especially on Earth's night side, is not all that great right now. And now it looks like maybe on the day side, you're going to get a little sizzle as well. So you're going to have to deal with that. Now, as we switch to our far-sighted sun, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see that in the northern hemisphere, that big, long filament, and you can also see how far it extends. As a matter of fact, as we switch to 304 angstroms, this is the red sun. Sorry, the images don't look all that good, but that's beacon images. These are the real-time images that we get. Better quality images come later, but in real time, it's good enough to see. Look at this massive filament as it launches off the sun. Oh my goodness, it's almost the entire extent of the sun in stereo's view. This is a big filament. It's the biggest one we've seen launch in solar cycle 25, and it is definitely uh, indicating what is to come as this cycle continues to ramp up. Now, meanwhile, back on the green sun, you can see the bright region in the southern hemisphere. This may be region 2775 as it's beginning to rotate back into stereo's view. It is still launching solar storms on the sun's far side. So we just have a ton of activity to watch and it looks like solar storms are definitely ramping up which is good news for aurora uh, uh, photographers and the bright regions are going to continue to increase that solar flux so it looks like solar cycle 25 is continuing to give us some good news 
Switching to our chronographs, now this is a chronograph from Stereo's view, and you can see back on the 22nd and the 23rd, look at those solar storm eruptions. This is the activity I was talking about that might be from old region 2775, but we're just gonna have to wait a few more days to see this region rotate back into Stereo's view to know for sure. But then look on the 24th. Do you see this big ring around the sun? That is a halo eruption. This is that big filament eruption. We can definitely tell because it's a halo, it's headed towards stereo, so it's not Earth directed. But it's sure nice to see these big halos again because that means solar storms that could hit Earth are definitely on the rise. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are in the middle of that solar storm from that fast solar wind, from that northern coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth's strike zone. And over the next couple days, the deepest finger of that coronal hole is going to be rotating in through the Earth's strike zone. So the storming isn't over yet. In fact, at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions with up to about a 65% chance of a major storm. And that should happen right about the 26th. At mid latitudes, we're expecting active conditions conditions, but we do have a 25 to 30% chance of minor storm conditions. So even at mid latitudes, there's going to be a decent chance to catch some aurora. We've already been seeing aurora and more is possible. So your war photographers enjoy this nice sweep because it, things will take, you know, at least a few more days before things begin to calm down and you can get some good shots in there. And for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, I know there's been a few contests here lately and it's causing issues for radio propagation. So just hang in there because things will settle down here in about a week. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we do have multiple bright regions in Earth view, including old region 2776 that's going to be rotating off of the sun's west limb and new region 2778. Now, the nice thing, though, is that they're not really all that flare active. We're only worried about C-class flares, so everything is in the green when it comes to big M-class flares. We have no risk for radio blackouts this week, so that should make GPS users on Earth's day side very happy. You don't have to worry about your GPS reception all that much, at least on Earth's day side. Of course, those solar storms aren't helping all that much on Earth's night side, but that's a different story. Now, also, we have a solar flux that's going to stay in the low 70s, possibly rise up into the mid 70s um, by the end of the week. We'll, we'll see. It depends upon how these regions continue to evolve. But that does mean marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side for amateur radio operators and emergency responders. And this will continue easily throughout this week. So once the solar storms kind of die down a little bit, radio propagation should be reasonably good and it will continue to stay that way. Now, also, because we are still trying to climb out of solar minimum, I know the sun is acting, but it's still kind of in solar minimum thus far. Uh, we have a bigger cosmic ray flux than we normally would, so this means that you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, you are in the marginal range for radiation dose, and this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is getting very exciting. We're already in a solar storm right now that's bumped us up to active conditions and brought aurora down to mid latitudes, and we're in store for more. That northern coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone, it has that finger-like extension that's really gonna be giving us a nice boost here over the next couple days, and that could bump us up to storm levels. So your aurora photographers, Definitely keep your batteries charged and get out there because you could definitely get some decent shots, especially at high latitudes. Now, we also had that gorgeous filament erupt, and sadly, it is not Earth-directed, but it's going to pass over stereo, so we're going to get a good idea of how strong that storm would have been had it hit Earth. So, Aurora photographers, you know, we missed out this time, but hey, you're already getting a solar storm, so you can't be too bad, right? Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, we just had another bright region emerge on the Earth-facing disk, and this one is going to be labeled 2778 if NOAA hasn't done it already. And that should be continue to boost that solar flux into the mid-70s, low to mid-70s over this next week. So as that solar storm calms down, you should be able to enjoy some marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side. And now for you GPS users, well, you know, solar storms aren't all that fun, right? You got to deal with uh, bad, pro uh, uh, bad GPS reception on Earth's night side anywhere near or Aurora, and it also makes it a little bit tough near dawn and dusk. So as long as you stay away from those regions over the next couple days, your GPS should be pretty top-notch. 
I'm Tamma the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T, for that. And uh, happy Halloween, everybody. I know it's uh, crazy times where a lot of you probably aren't uh, celebrating Halloween. Neither are we. We're not even handing out candy this uh, year. The, that's so sad. So if you can't guess, I am the witch of 2020 this evening. Ha, 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 ha. That's right. Let me try to get up here. Uh, Nothing uh, is scarier uh. than 2020. So <laughs> as some wonderful. of the things that... <laughs> some of the things that have been crazy this year, right? So let's start. Yep, we we got a pandemic. I brought that to you. And along with the pandemic, I gave you a toilet paper shortage. <laughs> That's right. Now we have to have these everywhere we go. And I just dropped them on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I also brought you the year of having to use hand sanitizer that smells like tequila. You're welcome for that. <laughs> oh, goodness. What else? Okay, so serious things. Uh, yep, I brought you some wildfires, some brush fires in Australia as well. Seriously, a lot of people started baking um, banana bread. I don't know why, but evidently you have all caused a huge flour shortage in the United States. So um, thanks for that, like a lot. I don't eat banana bread, but okay, let's go over. What else do we have here? Murder hornets. We've got those twice this year, by the way. They started in May and then they came back now and thank goodness they have vacuumed them up. <laughs> and we've got... Uh, We've got the Tiger King and Carol Baskin. Oh, my gosh. If you are actually brave enough to watch this show, um, Jeff and I tried. <laughs> we really did. We got through about an episode and a half, and we said, this is like pure craziness. Uh, nope, we're out. Uh, what else do we got going on here? We've got um, hurricanes. Like, poor Don. And he's in and out of power right now, and hopefully he's watching. But, like, five hurricanes to Louisiana in one year. This is ridiculous. It's yeah, got to stop. He's, Don has been through a lot. In fact, Don, you forgot your hat. You got to <laughs> take your cover if you're going to be out there in the hurricane. <laughs> right, Amanda? <laughs> That's absolutely correct, Gordo. What else? Oh, okay, what else did the Witch of 2020 destroy? I destroyed the Olympics. I canceled them. Canceled. Completely done. It was awful. Um... Oh, yes, I have this crazy storm of an election coming up. Um, wow. What can I say? If, I, if I'm going to bring mayhem, I'm going to bring it all, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the other thing I want to say is last man standing. Really sad that this is going to be its final season. But I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I have purely enjoyed that show. And the fact that they're... It's, it's not that it's being canceled, right? It's just, it's come to its end of life. So as with a lot of shows, they say you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Thank goodness we're actually going to get that ending with Last Man Standing. So you're going to see a finale in everything that was meant to be. So again, thanks to John Amadeo for producing this show, which is amazing. And all of us hams really, truly love it. So um, if it had to end and the witch of 2020 brought it to you. This was the way it was going to go. Oh, okay. Gordo and um, Georgia, we, we heard some interesting things this evening, by the way, great club that we had. And I love the fact that they had no membership, no dues, things like that. We, we also have some clubs like that here in Colorado where the only way you become a member is actually participating and working for those clubs, which I really, really love. And I, I, I hope nice. that a lot of people take a look at that where it's not just about this whole set of bylaws and you're just going to send a check every year and that's all you do. Nope. Mm -mm. You actually have to work for it, work for your membership and work for your status in the club. So I really appreciate those kind of clubs. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, for bringing them on this evening. I did want to talk a little bit, Gordo, this is this is probably a heartfelt for you. And um, again, the FCC was brought up in the $50 fee for hams. And Gordo, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, we'd love to hear them and how you're dealing with this as since you get so many new licensed people and what that means to you. Um, 
The $50 fee is based on what it takes to keep amateur radio licensing rolling through the commission. Um, I would think maybe a 20, maybe at the most $25 fee would be more equitable. I worry that if we say FCC, no, we aren't going to pay any $50 fee. I mean, no, I mean, we're ham radio operators. I think we got to go in a little more easy uh, so we can stay as ham radio operators with frequencies. If we go in with the attitude of no way we're going to pay a fee, uh, they very well might sell even more of our microwave frequencies. So I think we need to maybe come up with a compromise of uh, what years ago used to be maybe a $20 fee, maybe 25 at the most for a 10 year license that's a bargain for all the bands we have that they govern. That That's some great thoughts, Gordo. I really like that. And um, the, the way my fear is, is that people will hear that they have to pay $50 fee for the license. And then they have to pay $15 to take the test in some organizations. Uh, then you have to pay to get your equipment to actually get on the air. And then you start totaling that all up and there's really not an incentive to get licensed. Um, that's one of my biggest fears is that, that, that it used to be a deterrent was knowing um, CW, of course. But now, with all of these other fees involved, it might be something that people will overlook. Um, I'd like to think about something in Gordo. We, we being the people that get people involved in ham radio, we need to think about something as maybe an initiative or an incentive or maybe a kickback. So, yes, maybe they pay the FCC $50, but we include after their testing that they get something in return, maybe a voucher or something with the AWRL or anywhere else. Um, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, but those are some of the things that I think would make it more valuable for a newcomer to get into this hobby, don't you think? Oh, I absolutely agree. In fact, many ham radio clubs across the country are getting a box full of the inexpensive Bayo Fangs or TYTs, the little 1995 pairs of HTs programming five of the uh, local ham radio frequencies and literally giving them to those applicants that will not only pass the test, but become an active member in the club. And that's such a great point you raise, Amanda and Jeff. More than just joining a club, more than just passing a ham radio test, we need to get these folks on the air and contributing to our hobby and Part 97, our service of emergency communications, which Amanda and Jeff, you really had going up in your area, Denver, as well with the fires. Absolutely. Um, some pretty sad stories coming out of there, actually. I mean, thank goodness we got a ton of snow, which really, really helped put um, a hurting on the, some of these fires. But we've had two of our largest fires this year. One is at like a 206,000 oh, yeah. and the other is about 195,000 and it grew 100,000 acres in one day, one day, people. <sighs> Um, when I talked to you guys last week, um, I was listening live on doing evacuations and um, some of the sadder stories are that there's about 300 to 400 lost homes. First of all, they can't get to oh. all of the homes right now, which is a, it's just devastating. The second thing is, is that um, five firefighters and two dispatchers lost their homes in the Grand Lake area while they were out dealing with the fires. Um, that yeah. was just yeah really, really sad. And I know that those stories come out of every fire, you know, but when you actually listen to them live, I was listening to scanner radio at the time and um, hearing some of these people. The other thing that was really devastating is that such a huge amount of area got evacuated that ugh, all these firefighters went out there to do this and they didn't have any food. There was no food from until from Denver, which was, you know, 100 miles away. Um, that was also very devastating to have to hear that on the radio that they were just hungry. So um, once an, it, a type two team comes in, Gordo, you know all about this. 
when these type two teams come in to handle these fires, all of that is taken care of. We have these big tent cities that come in and move in and they take over all communications. First of all, they bring in all of their own repeaters <laughs> right? and everything is handled. But in the meantime, during that transition, things are really, that's where hams come in a lot of times where Absolutely. we'll, we'll probably handle maybe evacuation comms and things like that before the type two teams come in because everything is chaos, like mass chaos. You've got your local search and rescue teams out there trying to evacuate people and they're on their MRA ones and twos. You've got um, your incident management teams that are probably on their own channel on 800. You've got your, your sheriff's office that are on their own channel on 800 and your dispatchers are losing their freaking minds because they're <laughs> trying to copy all of this traffic. And it's, um, again, it's chaos. So again, what, when, even when the Irving, Irvin fire started Gordo the other day, um, mass chaos did 60,000 people evacuated. Can you imagine 60,000 people evacuated in any area of your life? Anyone here watching? No, 60,000 people evacuated in five minutes is ridiculous. Uh, first of all, there's traffic control. Then there's going door to door. Then there's um, road and bridge that gets involved, and then there's water, and then your other utilities that all have to get involved, and they're all on a radio. It's just ridiculous. And a lot of times things get busy, and um, a lot of pertinent information gets left out, and also there's a lot of busies, so you can't actually get through to your dispatchers to let them know what's going on. So uh, I'd love for y'all to listen to that sometime to see how crazy it is. All right. I know we got to wrap it up here. Um, George, nice costume, by the way. And uh, you have a you have a show coming up Friday night, right? Are you going to have a different costume? Uh, you know, I hadn't even thought about what I'll have uh, Friday night. Yeah, it'll be the next episode of Ham College. We're going to be covering the, well, amateur television on ham radio on the extra exam and that's uh you know there's several different modes there it's it has uh, changed a little bit over the years so we'll be talking about that it's not all just ntsc so uh, maybe a little bit to study up on there and amanda it was good to talk with you last night and uh, hear you on the net and i think i don't know if you set a record on the number of different modes but you and Jeff really came up there. We did. We tried everything, man. We had D-Star, DMR, Ham Shack Hotline, Analog. I'm missing one here. Oh, P25. So we did. We tried everything, and uh, that was fun. And um, it, Mike was a great net control, VE3, MIC. He, uh, he was a real sport last night because he had some challenges in front of him, and he, he, he came through <laughs> with shining stars. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go yeah. over some nets. Uh, we uh, have some nets and some nets we're not having because W7UDI had to go out on another fire call. So we were supposed to transition over to 75 meters this evening. Unfortunately, folks, we're not going to have that. So stay tuned next week. And then um, Kevin, KC7FBF, I think he's around 7192. It was a little bit noisy there, but uh, check it out. Have some fun on the on your 40 meter net, and then we have um, D Star on 14 Charlie and DMR on 31012. So you have no excuse. You have plenty of outlets. Get on a net, support our net controls, and uh, have some fun. Uh, with that, everyone, again, stay safe. I know numbers are skyrocketing through the United States right now. Also, go vote. It's very important, and. Um, I don't know that we're going to see a president next Wednesday. I don't. I don't know that that's going to be decided. <laughs> I really, really hope so, though, because I am so tired of seeing on Facebook to go out and vote or register to vote or hearing all of these political ads. So I hope it's decided and that we're done with it, so we can move on to the next chapter in our lives. I'm sure, uh, George. I'm sure you're with me on that, and Gordo too, right? <laughs> Ab absolutely. And you know, you're right about hams. No, I think that should do it. I think they're, they're working on it, but uh, there is fire right in the canyon, a whole quarter mile from me. There you go. So uh, that's yeah. almost a live call coming through. So we still have our fires out here. No snow, just tons of ash. But 
at least we don't have it as uh, as bad as Don has it. So Don, if you're watching, we've got your hat. You forgot your darn hat. So get that hat on. And all of us say uh, good luck, Don, in the middle of the eye of the hurricane right now on Ham Nation. Amanda, back to you. And George, it's a pleasure always to work with you on Ham Nation. Thanks, Gordo. Appreciate that. That hurricane is really fast moving. It was a Category 2, I believe, when it hit land. But it is moving forward at a really fast speed. So it'll be out of the way here pretty quick. I don't I don't think maybe we'll get a half inch of rain here. But no fires around here, and that's always a good thing, too. We're not plagued with it as much as you people out west. But, you know, we do... We do have some here occasionally, and it has been really dry, but the last few weeks, the rain has helped out things a lot here. So that's all I got, Amanda. Let me say nice costume tonight. I see you've got everything you need there to to clean up. Yeah, Uh, the only thing I I left out is like... Uh, an excess of alcohol, I think, um, <laughs> that was consumed during the lockdown. Uh, other than that, uh, I think I covered it. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. Uh, and uh, we think about uh, Dawn out there during the hurricane. Thanks, Bob, for coming in this evening. Really appreciated your club spotlight. Can't, uh, can't thank them enough for being here this evening. I'm Jason Howell, host of Hands On Android, where each week I take a look at the Android operating system, really dive deep into what it can do for you and how it can improve your quality of life, whether it be tips and tricks on how to use it better, whether it can be little known secrets that open up a world of possibilities, so many topics to dive into, including your emails. Subscribe by going to twit.tv slash HOA. We'll see you there.